Thanks a lot. This is for me coming out of closet talk because I've been working on this project for, I don't know, four or five years and this is the first time I'm kind of talking about it to a larger audience. Um, I will be talking about the dramatic social, social spatial change in a small Illinois town called Beerstown with about six to 7,000 population that in the last 15 years has changed dramatically from an all-white sundown town to a multicultural, multilingual, multiracial uh, community with over 30% of its population now as immigrants. This change has been due to labor recruitment practices of its meatpacking company, Cargill Meat Solutions. Cargill slaughters and packs more than 18,000 hogs per day in its, by its 1,700 workers on the production floor. Um, this river town, about 40 miles outside Springfield, as a local site of global capital accumulation, is intensely connected to multiple um, locations around the globe. It is not only through corporations' production processes, but also through people's translocal livelihood strategies that stretch from Latin America, predominantly Mexico, to West Africa, predominantly Togo, and to Alaska. In many ways, this community is more connected to these far away global locations than to the four hour away Chicago. To understand this complex social space, I have relied on a multi-sided global ethnography. I started the project in 2004 in Illinois and with the support of CDMS, I'm very grateful for their support. And I um, was able to do the Mexico part of the project last summer with the support of Latin American studies. But today I will only talk about the project in, within um, Beerstown in Illinois. And I would like to be able to do the other sites in the close future. So if you have good students for do that, doing the Togo part, send them my way. Um, I thought a lot about where do I, mm, where, how to frame this very complex uh, uh, mm, um, story in, uh, in the space of 30 minutes, and I could have taken many different um, angles to the story. I could have spoken to you about um, the racialized history um, of, of this town as a sundown town that enforced black segregation through informal but brutal means. And I could have talked about the dynamics of change from the perspective of the established residents or white residents that, as one of them said, we did not want to go to the world, but the world came to us. I could have also talked, uh, focused on um, behavior and logic of capital, the changes in the industry and its relations with the labor, and how this rural site is a strategically of interest to an industry that has the highest rate of labor injuries. It has 30% lower pay uh, for um, average wage than other manufacturing jobs industry and has a great reliance on labor recruitment among immigrants. For that, I could have talked about corporate multiculturalism as a set of practices that celebrate multiculturalism in order to silence it and achieve a fragmented labor force. Or I could have focused on transnational household families that I interviewed back in Michoacan related to the Beerstown families and talk about how on one hand global capital to manage its crisis of accumulation and on the other hand immigrants laborers to accept low pay jobs in a high risk industry. They both have to rely on translocality in social reproduction of labor. But I decided to focus on these two points, and I hope that by the end of 30 minutes I have achieved to do it. Um, the two points are as follows. The diversity in immigrant experiences based on their local and translocal resources, networks, and histories, right? And secondly, the, the, the agency of in immigrants, basically talking about the um, range of mediating spaces and, and uh, institutions and sites that immigrants use in order to renegotiate their interracial relationships. So the two points of 
and diversity and agency are the two that I would like to um, stress and share with you today. In order to do that, I would like to take you, share with you two stories of the two immigrants, Jose from Mexico and Ellen from Togo. I'll take you to the parking lot of Walmart, the, the site where I first encountered this um, um, multicultural community. Jose parks his car and gets out uh, with his uh, three children. He arrived here, he was one of the first immigrant Mexicans who arrived for working at Cargill to Beerstown in the early 1990s. Um, unlike other um, early wave of me Mexican workers who arrived by direct recruitment by Cargill, who sent mobile recruiters to the border towns and basically shipped uh, the workers to, to town, um, Jose arrived from California uh, with a word of mouth by, through his uh, cousin. The California prices were expensive to live and insecurity of job here was a year-round employment and a mm, relatively cheaper place to live. There he came. The first period was very difficult, as he says. The, there was no rental housing market and he basically slept in his car for the first two weeks uh, and while go taking the night shift and working in the factory before he could have enough to, to rent a place on his own. Um, now he, he owns his own house and he actually has another house that he's renting to other, other immigrants in, in town. Uh, he finished um, high school, unlike mo many, most of the other uh, Mexican immigrants in this town, um, he has a high school degree. He is from a rural town in, in, in um, Michoacan and he's third generation migrant. His grandfather was the first generation came to U.S. to build the railroads. His father was um, in U.S. as part of the Braceros program as agricultural laborer. He and his siblings are basically the third way in their family. That means also that and the extended family being here, his pressures for, provide, for, for sending remittances is, is less. Now that he has got 25 members of his family, siblings, their wives and children, etc., are all there. The best part has been that they have been able to bring in their mother-in-law. She takes care of all the children while the, the, all the adults work at Cargill, and they are, every single one of them are now connected with Cargill. As we are talking across the parking lot, um, uh, Elena arrives. She uh, um, is in her bright uh, colored African dress and um, African uh, head uh, dress. She greets Jose in Spanish, Elaine is African, um, uh, French speaking um, from Togo, but she speaks this, and greets Jose in Spanish because she's picked up a few words in Spanish. Her child has been taken care of, Jose's mother in law, a practice now more, getting more and more common among the immigrants. Um, she arrived with her husband about four years ago, um, but the first wave of, of Francophone West Africans arrived to Beerstown in 2003. Um, she came with lottery visa, like most of the West Africans. It's called diversity visa, was instituted in 2001. And most of these um, West Africans have, they say, we played the lottery, but basically means that their name was um, picked up on the um, visa that they could come here. She's highly educated, like most of the other West Africans in this town, um, about, I believe, um, 50, more than 50% of them have college education as, and higher. She was a teacher is a, a back in Togo and her husband is a mechanical engineer. They came here and they are both cutting meat, as they call it, in that town. They have the limitation of speaking English because they are French speaking and they have a huge debt. The cost of travel to here for each of them is about, each person is about three to four thousand dollars. That was why she had to leave two of her children behind back in Togo. And um, now she has to send remittances not only for her children, but also the entire extended family relies on her because there are not that many of, of Togolese that are overseas and they could send um, and rely on sending money. So last year was a very stressful time for, for um, Elena and her husband as the husband got in a, in a dispute in the factory and lost his job. And, uh, but what happened is that he joined the other group of West Africans that now increasingly take jobs in Alaska. So they move periodically in groups of five to 10 to Alaska from, from Beerstown and work for three to six months. 
it is okay. It bring, they, it, the work is backbreaking, but not worse than Cargill. And that, so they say. So let me just uh, reiterate what, I could have taken the whole day talking about stories, but reiterate what we just heard. We heard, I hope, the first point, which is the diversity of the immigrants in this community. Um, that f first of all, is their numbers. The Mexicans are much larger, about two and a half thousand, but uh, um, the South Africans are 300. Um, again, when I say Mexicans, I really am, mean Spanish-speaking, Latin Americans, and Caribbeans, but the majority are Mexicans. Their education, these are the surveys that I conducted in the community. So um, college education were more, 14% for Mexicans versus 54% for French-speaking Africans. So they are very different population. Their um, education level is different. Their ability to bring their family, most of the, the Latin Americans or, or Mexicans actually are here with their entire family intact, while the Africans, most of them, uh, or many of them, 33% of those who have children have their children with them in U.S. So the other ones, of, of the ones, 67% do not have their family here. They have children, but they have left children behind. A uh, history of recent migration is very different for them. The sense of entitlement, Mexicans being third generation, they have been here, they are part of networks of information. For West Africans, this is, although this is the largest, I mean, the, the information is that the wave of Africans coming to, migrating to U.S. now, since 1990, has been larger than the transatlantic slavery um, move. But nevertheless, is in the modern time, it's a newer history. And last but not least is the financial depth, the, the, the reliance, the, the burden they have for sending money back home is much larger for Africans. So, now I want to move on to the second point, which I talked about the, the agency of these immigrants or you know, the, the sites of mediation. I want to first uh, flag that, that we have to consider these people arrive to this town in absence of any public or private institution to receive them, like public agencies and services and social services, etc. So they basically come to the ground zero, if you want to call it. But there are three critical moments important in understanding of uh, what I am going to tell you later on. One is the 1996, the explosive moment, when after five or six years of having these immigrants arriving to this all-white town, formerly all-white all town, there was six-foot-tall um, cross burned in the plaza, the Mexican um, tavern was, was burned down, there was a KKK march in town the next day, FBI checked and said these were out of townies that were here, that, uh, whatever. So there was a very difficult moment, 1996, and it shook the local community, the corporation, and they had to do something about it. So it, to a certain degree, it radicalized the local community. The ones who were, did not want to see brutality in their town had to mobilize and do something in support of immigrants and ease it for them. And, uh, and, and so the other way around. And, um, and 2007 is also important because that was the raid. That was, I think most of you might remember, two years ago, a year and a half ago, ICE raid um, in, in Cargill arrested about 60 of them. So these have been important points, but what has happened as a result of this kind of these um, tensions and periods is that, um, oh, I forgot to tell you this. Uh, anyway, uh, Cargill's reaction was that when in 2003 um, the, the, um, Mexican, the, the West Africans were brought in, did not want to see the um, 1996 repeated. And therefore, it adopted a strategy of divided geography. So they sent all the, the West African recruitments to a town next door, 10 miles away. So we had Mexicans here in Beerstown with the whites. We had West Africans in Rushville, which is 10 minutes, um, 10 miles away. And then African Americans historically were kept in Jacksonville anyway. So you created, the corporation created this geography of three cities with three different racial kind of uh, compositions and histories. So, um, and then uh, what, what I want to talk about is how this, I would put all of them up there and then I don't have to worry. Okay, what was the role of these uh, institutions that try to mediate this rapid, this dramatic change? Churches have been very important, especially Catholic Church, 
They flew in three Mexican nuns right after 1996. They were brought in from Pueblo, I believe, to, to Beerstown because the poverty, the social problems were just massive and there was no uh, support system in place. So the Mexican nuns were very important and a pastor that was bilingual English speaking was brought in also. He played the liaison between the factory and the communities as well. The schools have been done doing a phenomenal job. I have some data I could share with you. But they basically started by from offering ESL, English as Second Language, to offering bilingual program. Now they have managed to offer dual language program. I don't know, those of you who are not familiar, dual language program means that every white family and every white child in that school gets half of their education in Spanish. These kids would go home with a half of their science material and math material in Spanish. And in order to get this approved, they had to, community and teachers had to basically agree. So this was a massive movement on the part of families and also teachers to use the school as a way of bringing these different lingual, linguistic communities together and creating a common ground. Library offers services in three languages, French section, Spanish section, English section, and most of their clientele actually are not English-speaking clientele. That's a different story. Sports and soccer has been incredibly important. The role that sports has played for bringing African um, and, and Mexican men together, childcare has provided for bringing African and Mexican women together. These have become, although from within the factory, there is a lot of um, strategies, not only the segregated residential strategy, but other uh, strategies within the factory to create, uh, to accentuate perhaps the racial tensions or create division among workers outside the factories. These are the sites by which workers has, have found common um, uh, mediating grounds to, to know each other and maybe overcome some of those um, divisions. Uh, housing has been very important and I just, um, uh, would like to say that um, in, uh, when you go to Beerstown, you do not see what you see in big cities. That is neighborhood for immigrants, neighborhood for Mexicans, neighborhood for this and that. There, it's all over, it's mixed. Um, there is no segregated, and the index of dissimilarity, if you want to talk in those terms, is lower than, for example, Chicago or other large cities. Um, that is a different story of why, um, and I, I believe it has, my argument is that it has to do with the racial history of the place, that they were not zoned because all of the others were zoned out of the community. So when the immigrants arrived, there was no regulation to put them in the pockets. But what is important is that now Africans have moved to Beerstown. So they overcame the, the segregation that the corporation set in place in the beginning. Mexicans have become homeowners. They have actually created a large stock of rental market because they bought these houses. They were affordable. They fixed them. Now they are renting. And as one of the friends was saying, she is a um, Mexican homeowner, she owns three houses. She said, I put my ad in Spanish. If I don't find anyone, I put the ad in French. Last, I would put it in English because they rely on the other immigrants. They think they make better tenants. So basically, availability of rental housing that has become through the first wave of immigrants now has brought the Africans from Rushville. Most of them now have moved from Rushville. So Beerstown has truly become a multiracial community that managed to get, overcome those separations. Okay, so what did we just, um, on the second point that I wanted to share with you. What did we basically hear? That the story of Beerstown reveal a process by which a locally based multinational corporation brings immigrants to an area and promotes for workers a segregated residential geography. This practice functions both to stabilize labor relations in a former sundown town and to construct a sufficiently divided labor force. What happens in return is that immigrants renegotiate their interracial relations in this company town and undo the divided residential geography through a range of mediating institutions and sites outside the plant and beyond the point of production. Now, having basically gone over the stories of, of talking about the diversity and, and um, agency of these immigrants, I want to take the next and uh, last five minutes of my time to go over uh, contribution, what, what does it say to the literature and what do we, to the sco existing uh, scholarship, but also to, um, so what question, I hope it, I will get there. 
The stories of Beerstown I shared with you today engages with three interrelated debates, globalization debate, rural communities as destination of immigrants, and formation of labor solidarities. Much of globalization literature theorizes the experiences of large cities um, and or global, is, theorizes the experience of large cities or global cities. In the process, this literature neglects the experience of company towns and small rural towns like Beerstown. I find the study of Beerstown in conversation with the work of James Ferguson on global enclaves and Guarnizo and Smith on transnationalism from below. Ferguson examines global capitalism and globalization through the study of mining and oil company towns of Angola and other Central, America, Central African um, countries. He reconceptualizes globalization from um, a flow to a point-to-point -point movement and writes, I quote, the movement of capital does not cover all globe, it connects discrete points on it. Capital is globe hopping, not globe covering, end of quote. Guarnizo and Smith articulate the concept of transnationalism from below, stressing constraints and opportunities that, con that um, stressing constraints and opportunities that contextuality imposes. To understand global processes, they stress a historicized and contextualized understanding of local communities and transnational practices of immigrants. Right? The study of Beerstown unpacks not only the racialized histories of the local community, but also distinct local and translocal practices of immigrants. Such a study contributes to grounded understanding of globalization. I hope that it does. And secondly, the study of Beerstown contributes to the debate on social transformation of rural America as new destination of immigrants. Literature that dominates the conversation, um, this conversation often pictures immigrants uh, in rural communities caught in, a, in the local and overpowered by the global processes. And, and the local and global are constructed in binary positions. Global as the active and transformative, the local as passive and recipient, or a site where global forces are enacted through overgeneralized experiences of immigrants. Such depoliticized parochial analysis offered through pers in these perspectives often conflates the experiences of immigrants and represents immigrants as victims of redneck rural communities of Midwest. The titles of these books are very actually telling. Middle of nowhere, caught in the middle, broken heart, you know, all of that. Immigrants in this analysis are, are stripped, of, uh, stripped of their agency as mere agents of factory production or cash cows for their remit remittance receiving communities and families back home and victims of racist natives in these newly diversifying communities of the Midwest. Um, also, the other problem with that literature is that often they are treated as, as um, minorities without seeing the translocal resources and, and connections they have. I think that is the other, that I have seldom seen re research that actually does this multi-sided ethnographic work that sees how they are connected to other parts of the world and it's make, what difference does it make? Could we treat them the same as Latinos, for example, in Chicago when we have these trans migrant um, um, uh, populations. Well, this brings me to the third conversation I would like to highlight here, and that's formation of labor solidarity. I am no expert on labor relations, and we have the um, esteemed um, scholars in that area here with us, um, Rod David Rodiker and Jim Barrett. But I come to this conversation mostly from the work I've been doing in South Africa in social movements and grassroots mobilizations around neighborhood services and residential neighborhoods. There, the, art, the debate that we have is about how mobilizing resistance and social movements through places of production is inadequate and social movement unionism, they refer to it, right? That they have to organize and mobilize outside the site of production. And I think that is the conversation that is useful in looking at company towns like this, where mobilizing through the factory is, if not impossible, is very difficult. But what are the alternative sites outside the production that could have the potential for creating solidarity or labor for solidarity. In contrast to seeing from the macro structural vantage point 
that may lead to a kind of overgeneralization by grounding the analysis of global capitalism in historically and geographically specific locations and actors, one can see the potential of particular forms of resistance that may emerge from below. After all, we see, what we see depends on where we are looking from. Looking at global capital production from the vantage point of a small company town like Beerstown in Midwest may bring into visibility things that might otherwise be overlooked and force us to think harder about issues that otherwise might not be easy to see. For example, the alternative sites and institutions immigrants develop and promote outside the production floor might be harder to see from the vantage point of the larger cities, right? Cities that already spatially have differentiated themselves. They have segregated neighborhoods for different population groups. They have differentiated and racialized spaces, places, and neighborhoods are already in place where these newcomers will just fit into. Moreover, the institutions like the um, institutions they develop and promote among immigrants is hard to see if we are only examining the interracial relations vis-a-vis -vis the natives, right? And often most of the uh, literature falls into that. They, if you have a multicultural, multiracial community, they measure Africans versus whites, Mexicans versus whites, rather than looking at interracial relations among those other minority groups, or merely focusing on those processes and dynamics that shape the labor force relations at the point of production within the plant. The study of Beerstown reveals the range of mediating institutions immigrants develop and promote to renegotiate their interracial relationships outside the point of production. These mediating sites are also contested and by no means free of tension by no means free of tension, prejudice, racism, and other forms of social anxieties. But recognizing the multiplicity in immigrants' agency and in mediating institutions and sites through which interracial relations are constructed and renegotiated beyond the corporation and its local plant is important. It allows us to recognize the potential for resistance and change. I would like to end here by quoting a phrase by a post-World War Swiss writer and novelist, that Max Frisch, that I believe resonates very much with the story I have been following in Beerstown. And um, that is, um, we wanted workers, but we got people. Thank you very much. I guess I'm one of those people who has a lot of work in a lot of different areas, and I have a lot of collaborators whom I work with on my various projects. Um, I really need to, to give a bit of um, credit, well, a lot of credit to Yan Wang, um, who got her PhD with me and left just a couple of years ago, and, and the work that I'm going to be talking about today is an outcome of a lot of very, very hard effort. Um, that she put into our mutual projects. As well, C.Y. Chu in the psychology department, a faculty member, collaborated with us extensively on this project as well. Some of our more recent work has um, dealt with Serbian refugees. I've worked with um, students and colleagues with Korean lesbians, and most recently with Mexican immigrants, uh, as well as Mexicans still living in their home country. It has done a great deal to convince me that immigrants are a very diverse group, um, even those coming from the same country and the same areas um, more locally within their countries. I also need to say that this research was supported by the Pampered Chef Family Resiliency Program, who provided support. And by the way, we are having a lecture about emerging adulthood with Jeffrey Arnett at 7 o'clock, right next door. So if you're not worn out when I'm done with you, feel free to come over for that as well. All immigrants face the task of learning to navigate their new culture. I think that goes pretty much without saying. They have to learn to communicate, and not only in words, about legal matters, health issues, safety issues. They have to learn new ways of doing things. And I guess the psychologist in me argues new ways of being um, when they come to a new culture. They have intricate inner workings of human relationships, not only those within their families, but those that they have to negotiate on a daily basis. Those who have or produce children 
must acculturate as well in the domain of parenting. I'd like to look at acculturation as a multi-dimensional process. There may be commonalities across dimensions, but today I want to think a little bit about acculturation and parenting as a specific domain. I came to think about this because when Jan and I were first working together, we went over to Orchard Downs right here in our own community, and we did a series of discussions, <coughs> focus groups, with Chinese immigrants living there. And we asked them, what are the most stressful pieces of learning about your new life here? What are the, what are the areas where you feel you might need help? And I remember again and again this topic came up, but one father gave me a particularly poignant example that I like to share. He had a 13-year-old son, and he had been living here in this country for close to 10 years. He said to me, when my wife and I first came here, we knew that we were going to be here for a long time. You know, you give it up. When you come here as a graduate student, you pretty much accept the fact that your life is going to revolve around this community for a while. So, and we knew that we had a young child, and we wanted to do a good job. We wanted to be good parents. So we paid a lot of attention to what European American parents do. What do they do with their kids? And I practically had an image of him, right, going over to the, the preschool and writing notes, carefully noting things that European American parents do. And he said, after watching them, we noticed that they praise their children all the time. They praise them for nothing. <laughs> they praise them when they haven't done anything. Praiseworthy. He said, so we figured we needed to praise. Right? Because our son will grow up in this culture, he'll go to school with these children, and we didn't want him to be odd. Right? We wanted him to fit in, and I understand that, don't you? He said, so we began praising. And now, he's 13, and he has a big head. <laughs> he thinks too highly of himself, because we praised him too much. And so what do we do with this problem? We tried to do the right thing, and then look what we get. It struck me as being a research-worthy kind of problem, right? That's how my brain works. So my colleagues and I, at that point, determined that we wanted to pay some attention to how these folks negotiate their lives, both as parents and as immigrants when they come to these new communities. I'm going to share a little bit with you today about what we learned from these Chinese immigrant parents. We recently published a paper on these data in the International Journal of Behavioral Development. I don't have time to give you everything, um, so I'm just going to give you a few high points and ask you to please take a look at that. Um, we also did a methodological paper that had to do with the sort of difficulty of doing cross-cultural research. Um, and that paper is in social development. So I invite you to take a look at both of those for more information. Our general goals were to examine how parent-child dinner time interaction patterns are situated within larger cultural ideologies. I'm not going to focus a lot on dinner times today, just to tell you that's the scene that I'm going to be referring to. Okay, what I'm more going to talk about a little bit today is how parental patterns of praise actually convey cultural values. And I'll point out to you that this is one of the few observational studies that compare parental praise in natural settings across two cultural groups. Lots of my colleagues have looked at praise in more experimental settings. So we had our challenges. Um, the apartments at Orchard Downs do not have good lighting. I'll just point that out to you, um, as well as being small. Um, let me just state for a moment um, what will be, of course, obvious, so I won't belabor it. Chinese cultural ideology about life in general, as well as parenting, is somewhat distinct right, from much of what we think of here in European mainstream um, US culture. We see, if we look on just the superficial level, uh, collectivist culture and prevalent interdependent self-construal, lots of focus on social patterns, social responsibility, and obligation within social relationships. There's uh, some emphasis on the connecti 
connectedness of self to other. Um, the primary goal is to, re is to um, retain and strengthen one's relationship with others in many cases. Um, there's emphasis on physical closeness if we look at parent-child interactions among Chinese parents and their young children. Empathy training, lots and lots of focus on that. Modesty training and direct parental intervention um, in children's activities. For Chinese mothers, immigrant mothers, and now I'm going to quote my colleague Ruth Chow, uh, who's written extensively on this population. She says, in order to be loving parents, the primary task is to be responsible parents with a close and long-lasting parent-child relationship framed within this intense interconnected focus. Now let's take just a moment to think a little bit about general patterns in European American culture and parenting. And lots and lots of folks have written on this much longer than, than I've been doing it. They've talked about uh, individualistic culture and prevalent independent self-construal. Lots of emphasis on children's personal space. So if you look at interactions between middle class European American parents and kids, you'll see lots of talk about personal space and independence and self-esteem, positive self-regard, and lots and lots of talk about autonomy, like helping the child to become autonomous. European American parents believe that an important indicator of loving parents is to promote self-esteem and any examination of current parenting popular press material will underline that point for me. My colleague P Peggy Miller and I also found that for European American mothers, self-esteem is believed to be crucial to many, many aspects of children's healthy development. Whereas when we asked the same kinds of questions of Taiwanese mothers, we found that self-esteem in their mind was relatively unimportant or even a concept that could cause psych uh, psychological vulnerabilities in children. So that a focus on their self-esteem could lead to problems of frustration, stubbornness, and unwillingness to be corrected. Okay, with that laid out as simply a way for us to begin thinking about this, I want to turn our attention for just a moment to what is praise. Okay, what is praise? How do we know when praise is occurring? Well, typically folks have thought about it as, in, in the context of parenting, positive parental evaluations about the child. Okay, so it's perceived in Western culture to improve or heighten self-esteem and intrinsic motivation. We praise our kids for the purpose of helping them become more intrinsically motivated to engage in tasks that we are praising them for and to feel better about themselves while they're doing it. <clears throat> praise can also, though, exert pressure to perform well and reduce perceived autonomy in some cases. This is how folks who've been looking at it for a long time have talked about it. Praise has been defined as positive evaluations made by a person of another person's products, performance, or attributes, where the evaluator presumes the validity of the standards on which the praise is based. So we presume that if I'm going to praise you for your um, fabulous hairdo, right, that obviously I know what a nice hairdo is, and we can all agree on that, right? So I have to have a standard that I'm referring to. So according to this kind of definition, Right? Um, we would want to know what that evaluation system is prior to determining whether or not something is praise. In the research, and there, there's quite a bit looking at praise, the majority of it, this won't surprise you, has focused on European American participants and has considered praise to be positive feedback contingent on a, an individual displaying desirable behavior. In other words, I don't praise you until you do something praiseworthy. Does that pretty much make sense to you and kind of fit with your notion of what praise is? So the past research that's looked at European Americans primarily has said that praise happens when someone does something praiseworthy. If you could, with me for a moment, acknowledge the fact that cultures have much in common. It's often our tendency to talk about the things that make cultures distinct. But cultures also have very much in common. And though they do have 
much about them that is quite distinct. Let's acknowledge first off that parents in all cultures typically raise their children to be socially adaptive. Okay, you do have weirdos everywhere, right, in every culture, but for the most part, parents want their kids to be pretty well adapted. That said, cultures with different dominant values may channel parents' child-rearing goals and practices into divergent tendencies. What I'm essentially saying there is, we should expect to see differences in how parenting happens based on the goals and the values that are happening within a culture. So if the past research um, on European American culture consistently heightens or highlights the role of independence when studying praise and its functions, would it surprise you to know that much of the past research has said that Chinese parents tend not to praise their kids a lot? That probably doesn't surprise you too much, right? Because when we're looking at praise, we're looking for it in a particular form. And we're also noticing that praise in past research among Chinese parents is often hooked up with another somewhat different animal in the average mainstream American's mind, and that is criticism. Okay, so we tend to see a lot more of what we refer to as criticism um, in those folks. So the dominant view of praise among researchers publishing in the top line developmental journals might lead us to, to have the impression that praise should look alike in all cultures, and if we don't see it in the form we're looking for it, it doesn't exist. All right, that's basically where we came into the picture. Our study plan was to use an observational methodology to investigate different, potentially different patterns of praise of toddlers in Chinese immigrant families and European American families. The specific questions that we, that we asked were, how frequently do parents praise their children? What are the functions of praise? Are there any functions that we have not been looking for and thus have not seen? Are praise patterns consistent with the general cultural norms that we know of in each of these groups? We did an intensive study looking at um, long-term interactions among 22 Chinese American families and 23 European American families in a local university town, shall I say it that way, um, to protect the anonymity. Um, I suppose I've already given away Orchard Downs, haven't I? All had, at the time of the study, two and a half to five and a half year old children. And we did as unobtrusive videotaping during a regular dinner time as one might do, right? Um, average length of the meal times that we taped were about 33 minutes in the Chinese families and 28 minutes in the European American families. I will be brief about this. Um, our video coding, we did, um, I refer you to the methodological paper, some ethnicity language matched coding um, with intensive training for both and then coming together and working through our findings together. We did, of course, all the requisite reliability checks um, with our research group. In our coding, we were looking for content coding we were looking for praise and we were looking for criticism in both types of families. I'm gonna talk mostly about the praise here today. We were also looking at structure and function coding for praise. I should reveal to you that I, my master's degree is in psycholinguistics, so I still have a great appreciation for the subtleties of language, right? We were interested in the structure and function of how those praises were behaving in the context of the interactions. In particular, we were looking for the sequence of the desired behavior and the praise. We were interested in knowing does praise occur prior to the desired behavior? Because in our initial um, pilot work, we saw some of them that look kind of funny like that to us. Um, or do they occur what we call post hoc, after the behavior occurs? Let's take a look at this. In terms of frequency, we found pretty close, actually. When we spread our net just a little bit wider, and we did not only look at praises that occurred after um, a requisite or a desired behavior, we found that there were about 8.4 praises in the Chinese family per meal of the target child, and 7.13 praises for the European American families. If anything, 
we saw a little bit more praising in those Chinese families. Now let's look at the structure of the praise. We found that most parents praise post hoc. Okay, so this fits with cultures have much in common. Right? Most parents were praising after a desired behavior occurred. But that 16.4 in the Chinese American families, the CA up top, is significantly more than the 1.2 in the European American families of praises that happen before the desired behavior. Did you get that, folks? 16% of the time in these Chinese families, they praise their kids prior to the desired behavior. And that only happens about 1% of the time among our European American families. They both praise mostly after, but that's a pretty interesting difference um, to us. Let me give you an, a couple of quick examples. I wanted to bring some video, but it's so difficult to get video to work when you're not familiar with the equipment, right? So um, pretend right, that I'm a three-year-old little European-American girl, and I am trying to butter my own roll okay, at the dinner table. And I'm insisting on it, and I'm whining, and I'm making a big mess, basically. And my mother says, honey, let me help. And I say, no, mama, 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 I want to do it. It's mine. And then I sloppily put the butter on while my mother watches. And then she says, great job, honey. You're a big girl. Now, does that scene sound reasonably familiar to you, either from your own childhood or kids you've babysat or people that you know? OK, now we're going to have to let me be a three-year-old Chinese boy. OK, and this would all be happening in Chinese, which I am far from fluent in, so I'm just going to tell you in English, okay? So the, the child and parents are standing near the table, and the father says, sit down, sit down. He tells the child to sit in a chair looking at the camera. And mom says, we need to eat, we need to eat now. And the child says, but I want to sit there. I mean, that's what three-year-olds do, right? They want to sit somewhere other than where you want them to sit. And the father says, where? And the child says, there. And the mother says, why? Just sit here. Um, I want to sit there, says the child, still insisting on his own choice. And the mother says, why? No, you need to sit here. This goes back and forth a few times, OK? Won't make you hear the whole thing. Then finally, the father says, they're still arguing about it. The child is not sitting in either his desired spot or their desired spot, still standing everyone. Father says, please, just sit here. You're a good boy. Good boy. And then the mother says, yeah, good boy. And then the child proceeds to sit. And the interaction goes on smoothly. Now, if this were the only time we saw this kind of pattern, I might just you know, write it off as you know, they're simply, they got confused right, about when he was engaging in the desired behavior. But the pattern happened many more times and across families. So contrary to the widely accepted idea that praise is given after a desired behavior has occurred, in this interaction we saw it before and in many others. It's a very common way, in fact. We actually found three models of praise. So you notice that I, I mentioned earlier that the Chinese parents most often praise post hoc. Right? So 83.6% of the time, they are praising after the desired behavior occurs. But what we found there, folks, was even when they do it after the behavior has occurred, they're often doing it in a way that's not focusing on the desired outcome. It's focusing instead on the process. It's focusing instead on the relational value of what they're trying to get the kid to do. It's not focusing on the child's individual attributes. So in the example I gave you of buttering the corn, or the, the roll, I'm sorry, the mother says, you're smart, right? You're, uh, you're a good girl. That's a great job. Right? It's focusing on the outcome and on the individual attributes of the child, whereas it's much more common in the Chinese post hoc praises that the focus has to do with the relational value of what the child is doing, the compliance, the relational value of that, and the sort of return to harmony um, in the family and in the personal setting. So we have these three different, behave, uh, three different models of praise. So one is pre-desired behavior, two are post hoc, but they look quite different, one focusing on um, the process and the other focusing on the outcome. So what do we make of this? One of the, one of the 
key points that we take from this are that behaviors and ideologies are two different components during the acculturation process, right? Behaviors compared to ideologies are much more easily changed under the pressure to acculturate. So my Chinese dad, back in the beginning of when I um, began talking with you a few minutes ago, my dad says, we, we praised, right? We did it. We wrote down like common praise words and we figured out that's what Americans do and so we did it. But his ideology did not really change, right? And we know that it didn't change because of the way he thinks about the, the consequences or the, the, the narrative that he builds along the way. I hope I'm not gonna get really loud now. It's just, I think it's just focusing on that, so. Um, so acculturation at the behavior level or what we see parents doing does not guarantee that immigrants understand or accept ideologies in their host cultures. And they don't necessarily need to in many cases, right? We're not saying that they necessarily need to do that. But depending on its cultural context, the important part of us as we go out to talk to our developmental um, colleagues is that praise serves different socialization goals. Okay, so in our European American culture, praise is used to support the development of independence. It is designed to get children to engage in behaviors, to reward them for engaging in behaviors that we view as acceptable and useful um, as they continue their development. In Chinese immigrant culture, praise functions to promote the development of interdependence. And it's a crucial function um, within that culture. Our results show that consistent with previous research, European American parents are tending to praise their kids for self-initiated behavior. So for example, I can give you a couple more quick ones. You are so smart, right? We hear constantly European American um, families and parents praising their kids for being smart, for doing things themselves, for being big kids. Um, Chinese immigrant parents also use praise to convey their expectations or reward the child's adherence to their expectations. Right, so here are some good examples. And again, please pardon my Chinese accent. Um, so they, they, we often found them praising their kids with things like um, guai, which means pleasantly obeying their parents, or tinghua, listening to their parents very well, um, or dong shi, right, understanding and following social norms. So the, the pieces of what they're praising seem to make a difference. So what's the, What's the take home message for us? Why is this important? Why is it important that Chinese immigrants or any immigrants coming to this country understand the acculturation issues in the realm of parenting? I'm reminded of a story that happened in Chicago um, in a suburb about probably six or seven years ago with a Chinese immigrant family whose daughter was taken away from them because she went to school with a mark on her face. Um, and of course, the school teachers do what school teachers have to do. Um, and they reported it to DCFS, and DCFS goes. And the father says, yes, I slapped her because she told a lie, right? And we have in our family a very important value on telling the truth, because if you cannot believe your family members, the entire harmony of the family is disrupted. So the child was taken from her parents' home, um, not for a beating, but for a slap on the face. The parents ended up, um, this was a story in the newspapers, um, and I may not remember it perfectly, but the parents ended up um, having to leave the country um, with their child because their work visas and their status as students ended up being problematic because they were charged with a crime. Um, that's a, an extreme example of what we often see happening in these families, but the difference in family politics and in practices both of parenting and in couple relationships have very, very real implications for how these families manage to cope once they come here and try to acculturate to a, what is often in many immigrant families a very, very different system. I think I'm gonna stop there in case you have some questions and because I'd like you to be able to come to the other talk at seven, <laughs> right?
I will quickly move uh, out of the way. Uh, I hope you have been able to take notes and uh, hold your questions for now. I would like to encourage you to please walk up to the microphone and ask uh, your questions directly. Um, and I'm just going to put this down. Go ahead. Um, this is for Farinac. It's, it's a factual question, but there's maybe something a little bit more interesting behind it. Um, I, th I think recently people that are interested in social movements are, you know, probably paying a little bit more attention to religion. Um, but for a long time, I think probably they didn't, and certainly in, in my field, which is labor history, people did not do that. And the factual question that I thought maybe you could talk about a little bit with regard to your notion of um, spaces w that, that workers used to uh, overcome uh, divisions. Um, I wondered whether with the Catholic parishes in this town, if um, what one point was I, I was simply assuming, which is maybe not right, that the, the immigrants from Togo were, were, to the extent that they were religious, also Catholic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also wondered about the native-born white population, in other words, whether there were Catholic parishes that wound up being mixed white uh, immigrants from Togo and also Spanish-speaking immigrants, and if there were, to, to what importance mm -hmm. that has to your yeah. story. The language is the main uh, problem there. So there are separate services in Spanish, in English, and then now there is a um, Congolese a priest that just started this year, and he does the service in French. So right now, because of that, they are not attending the same service for language reason. And there are not other events within the parish that might mix uh, different languages or not? Uh, no, the, the invitation goes out, but it doesn't, you know, you have few of one, but it would be usually predominantly the language in which the program is being run. Like, the mix, like celebrations, for example, for the Independence Day, that Mexicans make a big deal that there is a parade around the city and it's, it's massive. Um, they, last year, for the first time, they, they made announcements also in French and they put it in the factory everywhere. So there were few French-speaking people who came, but it was predominantly uh, Spanish-speaking. No, oh, thank you for your presentations. Um, my question to you is primarily about the existence of co-ethnic um, co communities or established co-ethnic communities and the role that they have in um, in these rural contexts. Um, you know, the, you, I think at one point in your presentation you talked about that are immigrants in new growth communities different than the ones in urban settings? Mm -hmm. And I would argue that just that phenomenon that in at least in urban settings you have these established long-term eth um, ethnic communities that are absent in these rural, they're, so, they're still so new. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what did you, what did you find in, in Beerstown and how did that impact um, their ability to just adapt or um, navigate the, to their new communities? So uh, mostly from what what are the differences being in a large urban center versus a rural from yeah. the point of not having pre-existing networks yes, of support pre an established um, mm -hmm. co-ethnic community and you also have the concentration of the community as well but mm -hmm. you don't have a, like in in Chicago you have Pilsen and you have Humboldt Park and you have mm -hmm. these communities that have been around and are and so newcomers coming into those communities have. Um, compatriots who've been yes. there for a long time. But yeah. you, that's a very different, this is departure in rural communities. The reliance will be usually, the stories I hear is that wherever you, when you arrive, you will have a sponsor, a family, basically, that says, come, you know, I will help you while you're looking for a place to stay. And in terms of the francophones, that they have to have an address before they can leave, before, before they can pick up the visa. So that is why also they choose, because they want to go somewhere where they can quickly get to, to work. So they arrive and they stay for a, about three months usually is the limit by which then people say, okay, now you can go and get your own place. So although there is not established larger community, but usually they arrive to a family at least 
that receives them and gives them housing and shows them around and helps them. But the main, you know, that is the disadvantage, that there is no, you know, the larger kind of fabric of support. But the benefit is, as I mentioned, is that the housing is affordable and then they, they mix because they can live anywhere. They don't have, they are not limited to one neighborhood. And that facilitates the kind of range of other dynamics in the community. So there are both the positive and negative side of it, but spatially it facilitates that mix more. Uh, I had a quick question for you, Angela. Um, one of the um, things I found interesting in your statistical sort of breakdown was your, the time slot for the dinners for the Asian American family, for the Chinese American families was about 33 minutes, I believe, and then for the European American was like about seven minutes less. And I was just wondering your insight on that. Like I was formulating hypotheses sort of like, um, were Chinese Americans grown up more um, maybe mannered where they're told to clean up after yourself and then whereas European American kids, they could just sort of leave or is that even out of the question if they're that small that they can't even clean up after themselves? So I was just offering or asking for your insight on that. It's interesting. They're pretty young. So the kids that we were looking at, I think across the families, didn't do a whole lot of cleaning up after themselves. I would say the biggest difference is um, we found a lot of storytelling in both kinds of families. So storytelling happens in the European American families. Storytelling happens in the Chinese immigrant families. And in fact, in many cultures, um, mealtime is associated with telling a lot of stories. In the Chinese immigrant families, lots of those stories, there tended to be more about past transgressions. So mealtime seemed to be a time when it's time to talk about and learn from um, things that one has done in the past. So for the um, um, European American families, there were stories that were told as well, and they typically were designed in our opinion, um, to show us how clever and cute and smart um, their kids were. And so the stories, there weren't as many of them, but they tended to be about darling past events, right, that illustrate or, or showcase their kids in, you know, very positive ways. Um, we've seen this, by the way, in lots of research studies, so it isn't just in ours. Um, but the Chinese families spent a good bit more time talking about um, okay, let me give you an example. So um, at school today, your teacher tells me that you um, pushed another child. Um, and that's a very wrong thing to do, to push another child. And it reminds me of the time a year ago when you pushed another child and that child fell down and scraped her knee. Do you remember that? And didn't you learn from that? And then it goes on. And so there's a little bit more of that what we believe is what we call opportunity education. So that the meal time seems to have a function of socializing the children pretty explicitly about social mores and kind of relational issues. I think that that's at least part of an example for you. Well, thanks <clears throat> excuse me, to both presenters for excellent topics uh, and presentations. I wanted to, maybe to both of you, I think you mentioned examples. I'm interested in, in law and the legality or illegality of these immigrants. And I think uh, the one idea was, you know, with the Chinese immigrant father was they were actually charged. So, of course, that has huge influence in shaping, yes. you know, behaviors. And then I think specifically, uh, Falenek, we've had discussions about, I don't know if you've thought more on this question of legal and illegal immigration mm -hmm. and how that has shaped or otherwise compromised agency. Um, I think recently also in Beastan there was this, this drug bust of the Mexican um, um, guy. So how people imagine law and how that, I mean, that idea of which side of the law you're on shapes uh, these intercultural agencies and relationships. We've been thinking about it a lot more. 
um, with respect to the Spanish-speaking immigrants that we're working with in a, a new project that I'm working on. Um, and my colleague, Evise Rodriguez, is here, and she could tell you a lot more about that. Um, but we've been thinking a good bit about uh, how that, that legality issue may impact on the relationships within families. So if you have children born here to parents whose legal status may be in question, how does that impact the politics, the power relationship that normally exists um, and, and of necessity exists in a parent-child relationship, especially a young child um, and parent? And as the child becomes older, um, and so I don't have a research-based answer for you, but it is something we're beginning to think quite a bit about um, and may in the future spend a good bit more time looking at that because it has to have an impact. I'm glad you brought this up because one of the important differences between the two groups, apart from education and you know, backgrounds, etc., is that uh, the, the Spanish-speaking community, the, the Mexicans, a lot of them, um, back before the raid of 2007, um, the company itself, maybe not officially, but everybody knew 80% of the Mexican workers were undocumented or had false documents. So this was a common knowledge by, from the mayor to everybody else knew it. And the French-speaking uh, uh, Africans are all legally here because they receive lottery visa, which is permission to work, and they could work anywhere. They really don't have, they're not chained to... Cargill, that has been a point of you know, potential for tension because they would say you are illegal, you are legal and you don't have any problem, you don't have to work here, you don't know what is my problem as somebody who is undocumented and is stuck in this town. So that could become the, you know, a point of, and it has been a point of tension. But that has also changed because after the raid, a lot of the um, Mexicans gave up their jobs. They, they didn't want to get to the point of getting arrested and then losing their families, etc. So they have looked for jobs in the farms around. So they live in Bearstown, but they work in the hog raising, you know, farms approximate kind of places. Um, what is important, you reflect that the legality is reflected, but also in the price that Cargill pays for recruitment. So for recruitment of every African worker, you get $350. For recruitment of every Mexican do, um, worker, used to be um, 150 and then it went down to $100, and then later they said we don't, it depends on how much they have turnover, how much they need, but even at the peak when they needed a lot of workers and they were paying, they would pay for African workers. Like sometimes I think it's like a price of a slaves, you know? African workers were paid more for because they were legal, they had documents, and Mexicans were shabby. But the new wave of Spanish-speaking Latinos are Caribbeans, actually, Cubans, and Puerto Ricans because they are documented. So now, because Mexican, after the raid, Cargill has sent recruiters to Puerto Rico and has brought in Cubans. One Cuban I interviewed, she was a neurophysicist. Um, it's just unbelievable the kind of uh, people that are working there. question goes to both of you. Um, you've both used ethnography to some extent, it seems to me, in your methodology. And I was wondering, the focus here was on immigrants, and I was wondering if you have been able to um, gouge a little bit reactions and discourses of the others, of the locals. So to uh, Fernet goes the question about the racialized local history of the town, and whether you have been able to listen a little bit to the locals as to how they see these new neighborhoods that are somewhat mixed, but not everybody's mm -hmm. there. Some of them are settled outside. And to Angela, um, you have this family structure, but surely the children are also socialized outside the family. So they bring in this point of view of the other. How do they view the acculturation process from this baggage that is also connected to mainstream American society? Thank you. Um, well, doing ethnographic work in Beerstown was really a major, major challenge. I mean, anybody who wants to do 
ethnographic work in a company town or has done it would know what I'm talking about. It took me at least three years to just start, you know, talking to anybody. And a, a, a fear, both by on my side, because I don't want to hurt anyone, by seeing that they are fearful of talking to me. So the workers were extremely, you know, closed and suspicious of what, you know, this is going to get me to. And both local community, they don't want to you know, say what they think. The immigrants don't want to you know, have anything to do with you. Cargill basically didn't want this outsider, you know, what are you doing here? So they tried to file complaint with the IRB saying, you know, she is harassing our workers. So I had to stop, you know, things around it and go back to her. So it's, and especially when you want to bring the question of uh, workers' abuse or, you know, labor rights or uh, racialized histories and racism, you know, these are all topics that each of, each of them would be very difficult. So the way that finally, you know, I think persistence was one thing that I just, for, you know, the last two years I have been having friends and people talk to me, but the first three years, it just being there and not doing any harm, and if I could help with giving information, I saw, you know, people, most of the people when you shake their hand, you say that their hand does, don't go tighter than this. And that is, you know, almost like common that they, they can't go more than that. And then giving information of where you can go, and these are you know, like free lawyers. Some of them had cases of pending you know, injury that they didn't know that the lawyer in Beerstown is in cohort with the company. Then I had this legal advice team in you know, Springfield, you know, so I would give connections. So that kind of things I did over time that they have finally, finally I built trust. So that was very important. But most important was when I went to Michoacan to Mexico. Then there were people who were injured and they were paid money for their injury, they would talk, or people who were part of recruitment, they would talk. So a lot of times you have to go somewhere else to be able to, to do that ethnographic work. When they were out of Cargill in Mexico, then they talked about condition of work. When they were in Beerstown, they didn't want to say anything because they don't want to risk. About racism, I also find it very difficult because people don't want to accept it. They don't even want to accept they were a sundown town. So what I, has been very useful or, or just by chance I found people who have left Beerstown, and one of them actually I interviewed here at university. So they are much more open to say, this is how we remember, these are the practices we remember. But within the town, it's kind of uh, difficult, especially me being dark hair, like accent, you know, outsider, foreigner, whites didn't feel comfortable to tell me about their histories of. So, but I think the multi-sided ethnography helps a lot in a situation like this. I'll be brief, but um, socialization is, is clearly a two-way process. And so anytime we look at uh, socialization with very young children, we're often very challenged to find a way to bring the young child's perspective um, into the picture. Um, we certainly can see them protesting at times um, their parents' desires for I think that's part of being that age. Um, but certainly they are getting influences from um, other adults that they interact with in the school system, um, in the daycare, other peers. But we certainly see it happening more and more as the children age. Um, we hear that from the parents, and we see it when we watch the interactions. So I'll just quickly say a couple of my other studies that I've been involved with, uh, one looking at Korean young adults with Sumi Okazaki in psychology and Nancy Abelman um, in anthropology. And we, we've been talking quite a bit with um, Korean students here on campus who are quite articulate um, about their perspective on their half of the socialization process. The Serbian refugees um, that my student uh, Vanya Lazarevic and I are working with are also incredibly articulate about their perceptions of their parents' acculturation and the kinds of stressors that they experience when they feel like their parents don't understand that they are growing up in a very different culture than the old country. Um, the Korean lesbians that we've worked with. So a, a number. Um, it's definitely both sides of the story. And if we had the time and energy uh, to be able to go in and thoroughly look at both with ethnography, we could see the interesting and beautiful dynamics of how they co-influence one another. So thanks for bringing that up.
speakers. Thank you.